Hi, good morning, everyone. I know there will be people joining us as we go along. Um, so we'll be a bit patient and wait another minute or so, I think. Oh, no, mind you, it's four minutes past. I'll just have to catch up. Firstly, I want to say thank you so much for everyone that is attending this very, very important press briefing. Your, without your voices as the media, this case could well, all these people's lives that were lost, all this could come to nothing unless us, the media, still keep this story alive. The story started, as most of you know, it seems hard to believe, in 2015, October 2015, when the then MEC for Health, Pudani Mishlangu, made that dreaded announcement that life vested many contract with the Department of Health was going to be finished, over, just like that. From then on, endless phone calls, emails, meetings were held, frantic families. I was in the offices of SADAC quite a few times when families would phone in, frantic, what can I do? We can't take these people in. They've got nowhere to go. You, Many of you know this story. From there, there was two court cases, an ombudsman report and an arbitration hearing. And now on Monday, finally on the 19th of July, an inquest will be held by the MPA where a judge will hear every single victim's story and then, and we hope do this fairly, they will decide if anyone who they were going to prosecute. And we hope there will be. Obviously, the whole idea is that prosecutions will come out of this dreadful story because within six years now, nothing. We, we feel that nothing really has happened except a lot of wonderful people have given their time. People like Sadak, Section 27. I, I'm just naming a few. Um, and of course, the wonderful... Life Testimony Family Committee, and you're going to hear about all this just now, was formed. So no one really wants these lives to be forgotten. There are many, many people that want their voices to be heard. Now, at the end of this, very, of the speakers this morning, you're going to hear two, two, uh, three other speakers, sorry. At the end, there will be ample time for questions. So don't feel as though your question won't be heard. It will. So if you'd like to use the chat box, post your questions, um, and hopefully we will be able to get through all three of them. Now, the first person I'm going to introduce you to this morning is Christine Imalo of the Life Asset of Many Family Committee. And she is very close to this story because she lost her dear, dear sister, Virginia, in this whole fiasco. So I'd like to ask Christine now to take over from me. Thank you. Good morning, Christine, and thank you very much. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for, for, for joining us this morning. Um, I hope I'm clear. Sorry, the network is very bad with the weather this side, so I hope everyone can hear me clearly. We can hear you perfectly. Okay. Um, so do I go ahead and just... Um, Um, this morning, I'm going to start off by reading the names of the 144 um, mental health care users who died during this tragedy. The first name, um, Aaron Mkwanazi, Abel Mkwe, Alfred Sitole, Benika Mukwanin, Bekimuzi Sitole, Musisiwe Shabalala, Keswa Mosiane, Katila Kunjulwa, Catherine Mari Dalanga, Charity Razzotto, Charles Stewart, Christina Lale, Christina Herbst, Christopher Makoba, Christopher Mokwerani, Cindy Van Royan, Clarence Disene, Dani Milan, 
Daniel Zulu, Daniel Yandenika, Daniel Charles Josiah, David Mbati, David Johannes Hienekal, David Khozo Mpofu, Debra Petla, Dedrick Johannes Bota, Elizabeth Bota, Elton Khos, Emily Mtembu, Eric Mang Mangana Mashulani, Zebeth Daniel, Felicity Adams, Francois Badenhorst, Franz Decker, Frederick Collitz, Frederick Stephanus Nelson, Gert Meyer, Godfrey Jablani Mnisi, Happy Makubela, Harold Ngosi, Hendrik Billy Mabue, Hermanus Bronkhorst, Howard Lowe, Howard Ngrovu, Elsa Fredericks, Isaac Mutiti, Isaac Tolwana, Ishma Makwe, Jacob Stolz, Jacobus Johannes Janse van Rensburg, Jabulani Mshongo, Jacobson Mudiba, Jan Snyder, Jean Banana Ranzue Tuse, Jeremiah Mudise, Johanna Tadi, Johannes Fuerta, Johannes Longwane, Johannes um, Umra, Johannes Peterson, Jonathan Motapo, Joseph William Golden, Joseph Gumede, Josephina Masuko Mshongo, Josiah Nkomuzi, Joseph Mabena, Juliana Idiboni Chawe, Julian Anthony Peterson, Karen Lachman, Idiboni Juliana Chawe, Kenneth Soka, Coco Nene, Unknown, Lucas Mutuane, Lucas Jeremiah Mudise, Lydia Zekeli, Magdalene Fulyun, Mama Mbele, Ma Macy Sina Mosalo, Manuele Batabili, Margaret Ngomezulu, Maria Mpabane Maretele, Ma Sweet Kozwale, Mateis Hartman, Matlakala Elizabeth Mutsuae, Matsobane John Matloko, Maureen Kunjwa, Mavis Twala, Mishek Komu, Michael Njolengwe Mukheti, Michael Patrick Tinery, Mishek Majuale, Mahuna Dubri, Monyani Taba, Muh Muhammad Adil Sharif, Mutufela Lohwabe, Mutuabisi Michael Colwe, Naledi Khotso, Nathaniel Soli Mashiku, Nelly Johanna Detroit, Nguenyama Thomas, Nicholas Anthony Yannick, Nomza Joy Simamane, Nata Na, Ntalani Fanasi, Ndombi Ndombi Magubela, Pokubela, Paulus Mokane, Peter Mvundla, Pache Nosi, Pit Sukhwala, Pit Silla, Peter Conradi, Pio Sibusiso Mtombeni, Raisibe Rahab Mangena, Rebecca Hap. Bati, Rudolf Bota, Ryan Fulham, Sam Sam, Sam Ndapo, Sanet Fisser, Sarafina Ngobo, Sol Ngosi, Sefoka Rifilwe, Sepati Janet Pilani, Sheila Motekedi, Sikrima Zanele, Sipuwe Makunga, Sipuwe Tabete, Siposteni Utawezi, Siabulela Roja Msimanga, Msizwe Tabang Katwayo, Solomon 
Sidumedi, Mutuashe, Soma, Kalani, Sophia, Manyana, Mulefe, Terence, Mapaye, Chava, Tembisile, Lillian, Kamini, Ian Kraus, Timothy Mumalo, Unknown Male, Victor Chauke, Virginia Macapella, Buyo Aaron Mondwane, William Mvulane, William M. Fakute, William Mkasane Fakute, Yvonne Musai. Those are the names of the 144 mental health care users who died during this time. Thank you, Christine. I know that must have been quite hard for you to do that, so we really appreciate it. You'll be hearing again from Christine just now. Next person we have to speak to you and to explain how important this inquest is and how it's going to take place is Umunyana Rujeje of Section 27. She's Executive Director. Thank you. Umunyane, would you take over now? Thank you, Marion, and thank you to Christine, who always speaks so eloquently in representation of the many family members who have gone through this ordeal. Um, and thanks as well to SADAG for jointly hosting this press conference. Um, so I think many of you know um, where we've come from. Um, there's been a, an outline of the, a bit of the timeline. This started in 2015. Um, and at that time, where there was an, when there was an announcement about the, the closure of these facilities and the cancellation of the contracts between the state and the facilities that were looking after over 2,000 people, um, there were many concerns raised by organizations like Section 27, like SADAG, um, and various psychologists and psychiatrists, uh, their associations um, directly uh, raised concerns and provided warnings to those responsible within the Provincial Department of Health. Um, the MEC for Health at the time, Gregani Mathangu, was, uh, we spoke to her, we wrote letters to her, um, saying that this was a move that was going to be detrimental to the welfare um, of very vulnerable people. And I think we have to recognize that um, as, you know, particularly in this moment, this very dark moment um, in our country, um, we have to think about those that are most vulnerable um, and appreciate that we have, have decided as a society that we must look after those who are vulnerable. We must look after their rights, we must ensure their dignity, um, and there must be a, a state that is responsive to their needs um, and that uh, listens to those who are directly affected and is responsive to the concerns that are raised as the families raise those concerns. Um, very early on, there was uh, the, the MEC for Health, the, the head of the Department of Health in Gauteng, did not take these warnings seriously, did not take the families seriously. Um, and it was only during the arbitration, which was as a result of the Minister of Health appointing the health ombud to, uh, to investigate what had happened um, at the Life of Sidimani facilities and to find out the circumstances of those deaths. Um, it was very important that during the arbitration that these stories then came out and that those very government officials who had ignored family members then had to face those family members and explain their conduct. Um, the, the process that we're going to now, which is an inquest, is quite different from the arbitration. And I know there've been questions about this. The arbitration was conducted um, after the health ombud made a recommendation. He made several recommendations, including one that required an alternative dispute resolution process to be undertaken um, in order for family members and for those who had survived the ordeal um, to be able to engage with the government officials and find some form of justice through a process. It was then agreed between the families and the provincial government of Gauteng that an arbitration would take place in terms of the Arbitration Act. 
that process was important because it was it was a it was a legal process. Um, it was done in terms of agreement between the families and the government. The government paid for that process to take place and supported the families um, through the process. It was also important that both national government and provincial government, as well as various officials who had been involved, had to speak under oath. Um, in fact, some of them had to be subpoenaed to attend the arbitration and to give evidence. And they were cross-examined by the legal representatives of the families at that time. The outcome of that arbitration, as you all know, was findings of unconstitutional conduct, but also very importantly, compensation was awarded to the families and to those who had survived. And it was important, that's an important outcome because it really is a way in which the, the constitutional violations are recognized by a legal proceeding um, and the government had to feel the pain. And so that compensation is an, is an important part of the continuum of justice that we are seeing and seeking uh, through various processes. So as we go into the inquest, uh, we should understand that it's different from the arbitration. Whilst all the evidence from the arbitration has gone to the NPA, uh, the National Prosecuting Authority is responsible for driving this inquest. Um, it is a process that takes place under the Inquest Act. So it's a separate legal framework that governs these proceedings. It happens in front of a sitting judge um, who will have a few things to, uh, to find at the end of these proceedings. Um, we obviously the NPA has their own strategy for how they're going to run uh, this process. Uh, Section 27 will be representing 44 of the families. We won't be able to answer questions about what the NPA is going to do or how they're going to run the process. All we can say is that the NPA is responsible for leading the witnesses. They've told us that they have about 30 witnesses um, who will be brought and will be giving evidence. Um, you will recall that after the arbitration, the NPA actually did a lot of work, found new witnesses. So there will be new people who are in front of this judge and, and will give evidence in this process. So there will be new information. We also know that some post-mortem reports have been made available. Those will also be part of this inquest. Um, and so the role of Section 27 and SADAG is to represent the families, but also SADAG in particular, um, who has been involved since 2015, uh, will, be, will be setting the scene to say what happened over uh, the many years of uh, various court cases in which they were involved um, and represented by Section 27, as well as all the advocacy that took place and uh, the, the mental health uh, framework um, and situation in South Africa is also important. I think the, the kinds of information that, that is really critical is to understand um, where mental health fits in the health system and the fact that mental health is a deprioritized issue within health. Um, and doesn't get enough funding and that we actually need to do more. And part of this process, as I say, is about finding justice for families, but also broadly to address um, mental health issues in South Africa. Um, the key things that this judge will find at the end of this process um, are quite legal. The, the, the judge having listened to all the evidence will have to figure out uh, the identity of the deceased the cause or the likely cause of death, the date of death, um, and whether the death was brought about by any criminal actions or omissions. So that's really the key, is to find out if there is a possibility that there was any criminal conduct. Um, the arbitration was not about criminal conduct. The standard of proof was very different um, from any kind of criminal finding. So here we're going to get an indication from the judge um, that will assist the NPA to then go ahead and, and decide who amongst the various officials um, uh, was part of the cause of the death of the 144 people um, and will then proceed to prosecute. That will be a decision of the NPA. Um, the, the judge will not direct that prosecutions take place. 
Um, so that is some information. We have also provided you with, or will provide you with a fact sheet that gives you a little more uh, detail about what an inquest is um, and some of the, the information about how to follow uh, the proceedings. As, you, as has been said, the proceedings will start on, on the 19th of July, on Monday. Um, it will take place online. So we will share uh, the streaming uh, details. Um, we'll probably also share it on our Facebook page and on YouTube, uh, try to make it as accessible as possible so that the media can follow um, and the families can follow and interested parties can follow the proceedings. I'll stop there, Marian, thanks. Thank you so much, Umunyane, that was fantastic, thank you. Um, I think that you've answered already, um, myself and Sadag looked at possible questions, and I think you've answered a lot of the questions that people would have. And as you said, information will be provided, links to the inquest to follow it and so on. Um, I would like to now recall Christine Marlowe and her side of the story, in other words, what the, incre the inquest means to her and the other committee members. Christine, thank you. Um, thank you, Marion. Um, the, the importance of the inquest for the families. Um, it's important for us, I suppose it's all part of closure. What the families want out of the process and why it's important is to hold those responsible accountable. There's been 144 deaths and these are only 144 that we counted during a specific time. There are many more who died after the fact. Um, so to not have anybody accountable would be like um, for the families, it would be nothing more than just getting away with murder, really. So what the families want out of this process is accountability and having those responsible put in jail. It's really that simple for us. And this would be part of closure. I mean, we've walked a very long walk as families to get to this point. Um, the inquest is not the end of it. We understand that as families. We understand that we, guys, we have to create, and the process has to link the evidence to the individuals for them to be charged. Um, so we are, I suppose, bracing ourselves for hopefully the evidence do in fact show um, those in charge and actually ultimately them being charged and going to jail. So it's not a very small step, it's probably part of the biggest um, um, steps that we have to um, undergo as families. Um, so it is very emotional, it is very taxing, um, and you cannot heal as families because we have not received closure. And that's why this process is very important and very pertinent. Um, and without the partners that we have, um, we have had along the way, I don't think as families would have come thus far. Um, as you know, the justice process in South Africa is very slow. And if you don't have the means and the support and the and the partners like the media as well, um, this would not have gotten the light of day that it deserved if it wasn't for the media. So as the families, we really, really thank you for your condolences. Um, and we're hoping that you do with all the other families um, that don't get to go through this process um, the way they should. Um, so please, we are um, launching the other process that we are engaging on is the families have put together Christine, you seem to have frozen. Um, I'm not sure, but it appears that Christine, you have frozen at the moment. What I might do is, Harriet, if I could perhaps uh, call on you until Christine lets us know if she's all right. If I could now. And we will come back to Christine. There might be just an internet problem where she is. I'd like to introduce screenwriter Harriet Perlman, who together with Sadak has helped produce the life, the very important Life Esther Domeni website. Harriet, thank you. 
Hi, thanks so much, Marion, and thanks to everybody who is here, the press, and thank you to SADC in Section 27 and Christine and the Family Committee, who are all partners on this project. Um, just very briefly, um, I'm going to just share my, my screen. So the Life is to Many website is an ongoing memorial and advocacy project for the families who lost loved ones in the Life is to Many tragedy, which was a story of unimaginable horror and hardship and, and cruelty. But there is another story too, and that's the story that you're hearing today of, of the families of SADC, of Section 27 NGOs who came together and fought back and who sought justice and organized in an extraordinary way. So we want this website to tell all of that story. And sometimes one says, well, why a website? Why? Because actually we want to keep the story alive and, and the different stories that we want to tell. The first, of course, is that it's very easy when people are lost in tragedies to think of them as numbers or letters, they are names, they are people, they are loved ones, brothers, sisters, uncles, daughters, sons, who died in horrific circumstances. And so we want to tell the story of them, of the people who are left behind, and the loved one who died. And we've done that by going to people's homes, and taking portraits of them and talking and hearing their stories and taking pictures of the person that they treasure most. Uh, sometimes that is the last picture they had of the loved one who died. Sometimes it was a photograph at a family event. Some of the pictures are, are simply IDs. That is all that they have. But each photograph held deep, deep memories um, of, of what had happened. And the second story is to tell the story on the website of what happened, how this unfolded, and to start to tell the story of, of in fact, those who are responsible for making that happen. And the third component of the website is we want people to tell their stories now. It's an advocacy tool for people who are still in the mental health system to come forward and tell their stories through SADC's extraordinary referral helpline supports network and system, people can write to us, go to the helpline, send an SMS, a voice note, and we in fact then will follow through with, with that story. And then just as a last thing, you know, what a crucial tie in with the inquest is in, in going around and gathering these stories, what struck me most, well, what struck me among many things, is people want justice. They want to know what happened and they want those responsible to pay. And I'll just end with, with you know, what Reverend Mabuye, who, who we sadly lost this year too, said, we were paid compensation, but it won't bring my son Billy back. Thank God I found him and could bury him in a decent way, but the pain is still there. The people responsible for what happened must go to jail. The government cannot push this under the carpet. And so just in closing, I think the tie in with keeping these stories alive, that they are real, that the pain of what happened is real for families uh, is very is a very important part of, of the inquest too. That's it from me. Thank you so much, Harriet. And as you say, you know, just keeping these stories alive and that's where the media comes in. It's so, so important. Something I forgot to mention earlier were the hashtags um, that are you can use, we want you to use, to tweet away. Hashtag life is to many, hashtag inquest, hashtag say their names, these will all be on the website, and I think Sadag will put this in the information pack, the, just to remind you to use these. Um, Christine, if we can try and come back to you now so you can finish, if I think your line is now okay. Are you there, Christine? 
Thank you. Can you pick I'm, up? I'm here. You... Yes, I, I am. Thank you, Marion. Um, I just really wanted to tell the the, the, um, the the media about the petition that the family had put together in regards to the monument. Um, and that's where I was when the network went down. And basically, it's just a reminder to say to them, we we need them to, to do this for, for the families. Um, we don't want the story to die, even if people end up in jail, which we hope that happens. But we also want a memorial that will remind South Africa and Gauteng, but also to be there for those vulnerable people to know that justice is also available for them. But we don't just want a memorial where they, it's a stone, where people come and lay their reefs annually. We wanted a, a living memorial, a, a hospital, similar to that of the Nelson Mandela Hospital, where people with mental illness can come and actually find and get the help that they need. But also, we need, um, um, part of the agreement that we had with the government was that they will have, um, in all five regions, a facility where people, early detection, I suppose, is a key word here, where people who suffer or who have issues with mental illness can actually go and seek help. And hopefully, when, thing, when, when these illnesses are found early, then people are able to, you know, can be diagnosed and, have a, and possibly live a normal life. Uh, and I'm saying normal uh, in inverted commas. But we need to do something. We need to change the way mental health is actually um, um, addressed in South Africa. We need to put mental health in the forefront instead of in the back. And this is part of the quest in terms of the monument. And this is the only way we see ourselves addressing this matter. Instead of having a stone which will cost millions of rands, we are rather requesting something that will do something for the people. Um, and this um, petition, an open letter, will be published over the week. So for the media, we as the family thank you from the bottom of our hearts. And we ask you not to get tired, to continue this road with us. And to SADC and Section 27 and everyone else that I'm not mentioning in this process, from the families, and I mean all the families, also the families of the surviving uh, mental health care users. We really, really thank you because um, justice is important for closure. And we, we need you to help us through this. And we thank you for having me for your um, Thanks, Mary. Thank you so much, Christine. Um, that's really much appreciated. We would love you guys now, please, if you have any questions, to post them in the chat box. Um, one question that's come from Laura Lopez Gonzalez was Are there, for the panel, whoever wants to answer this, are there any other legal counsels? representing families at the inquest. Uh, Umunyana, could you answer that for us? Sure. Um, thanks for the question, Laura. There are uh, no other uh, legal representatives for family members. However, there will be other witnesses that probably will have legal representation, like some of the high-level government officials. Um, we don't have a full list of, of those witnesses. Uh, but it's very likely that they will be legally represented and they, they are allowed to be legally represented. But we will represent the family members, 44 of the families. Um, a question I have for you, and I, I think a lot of people are burning to know, is will Kudani Mishlangu actually be at the inquest? Have you had confirmation on that? We don't. Um, as I said, we don't have a full list of, of the witnesses. Um, that's a person that the NPA would call and examine uh, themselves. Uh, so we, we don't know, actually. Um, we know that during the arbitration, we actually had to subpoena some of those government officials. Um, so it's likely that that's what has happened on the NPA side, but we don't know. And talking of her, of course, the other two people that were very prominent in this whole issue was Dr. Barney Celebano and Dr. Manamela. Um, do you know what's happened? Have you heard anything about the disciplinary process of any of the three people? Look, there were a number of disciplinary processes that took place within the Department of Health. 
um, and some of those people were disciplined. These were government officials that were involved in various um, aspects of the, the marathon project. Um, but we do know that um, one of the outcomes of the arbitration was that there was an order given by Justice Moseneke that all of the people who in their professional capacities um, conducted uh, these actions should be reported to their professional bodies. So Barney Celebano, for example, was reported to the Health Professions Council. Dr. Manamela was reported to the Nursing Council because she um, was a nurse. Um, and so those processes are ongoing. Um, we know that even this year, two months ago, um, there was a hearing scheduled um, in Dr. Celebano's hearing, but that was postponed. So these processes tend to be dragged out. Um, there were various appeals that took place. And so we still are not at the end of those processes. Those are, those are also very important to make sure that we see those to the end um, and that people like Barney Celebano are removed from uh, practice as, as uh, health professionals. Um, that is what the HPCSA is empowered to do. Um, two people have asked the same similar questions on how long will the inquest, if you know how long it'll go on, is there an actual set time? Is it one day, two days, or is it just going to go on until everyone's heard? It will go on until everyone's heard. Um, and, you know, some of these, as, as we saw in the arbitration, some uh, witnesses take longer. Um, some cross-examinations will take longer. So we, we may see that some witnesses take more than a day, um, but we are you know, looking at probably 40 days or so um, to, to get through this process. Um, because you know, the, these, we need to hear from people. Um, the evidence is really important. They will be taken through documents um, and refer to documents. So that kind of thing does take time. Um, and the, the process like any court proceeding takes as long as it takes. Um, so unfortunately we're in this for another long haul and I hope that the media is able to continue the coverage um, and, and inform the public about what is happening and, and what unfolds during the inquest. Yes, I mean, unfortunately, there are so many issues going on in the media at the moment and, and you know, they're going to take up a lot of space, but hopefully that's why we're having this today is to, you know, beg, plead, please, guys, um, cover this. Somebody has asked the Premier, uh, again, I don't think you do know the answer because you don't know, I think we need to get it out there that you have no idea who is going to pitch up on that day. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, we um, can't say. And Sasha Stevenson has asked, read the legal representation of families. Section 27 is representing 44 families. And we understand that Herta's species is representing some of the families that they requested, represented at the arbitration. We don't, however, know how many people they are representing. We don't know about others. That's more of an answer than a question. Thank you. Um, also, Zanella Mabunda wants to know, also does the inquest exclude families of those who have survivors? Um, it, 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 the inquest is, an inquest proceeding only takes place when there is an unnatural death. So this really is about delving into the deaths, um, the cause of deaths, looking at the legal causation issues around deaths. Um, they wouldn't be involved because the inquest act does not uh, refer to people who survive a particular event. Um, this legal framework is specifically to look at, and if there's any unnatural death, actually the inquest act does kick in and an inquest can be held. So this particular mechanism um, is intended to get to the bottom of the cause of death and whether there's any criminal liability uh, that can then result in uh, prosecutions, criminal prosecutions. Now, there was a judgment that the victims' families are each supposed to be paid out costs, and plus, I think I'm right, it was in a million rand per victim. Um, I believe that only very few people have been paid out so far um, because there's so much red tape in the way. Umunyana, could you comment on this? 
That's not accurate, Marion. Um, the, the people who were part of the arbitration um, and who were paid, uh, were paid out immediately by the state, the people oh. who were involved in the arbitration, there were people who later came forward and the government did open up for a period of time for people who were not part of the arbitration, but who were similarly placed, could come forward, show which of their loved ones, which uh, facility they were at, and there was some due diligence that was done uh, for those people who came after. So remember, this is a the arbitration was a process um, that was done in terms of basically a terms of reference. So there was a named group of people who were part of this arbitration both the bereaved families and those who had survived. Those who had survived were represented uh, by, the, by the Legal Aid, uh, Legal Aid South Africa, um, and they were paid out in a different manner to uh, the bereaved families who were paid directly and immediately by the state. Um, from Zanella Mabunda to everyone, um, she said, those who are not paid in full is the second group that followed after. It's still a legal battle. We are about 150 people, so good luck to you. Um, also, Julia Cheskelson um, has posted that the inquest is also only focusing on 144 deaths that are known and won't investigate the situation of MHCUs who may still be missing. Um, I'm sorry, but uh, MHCUs, could you just clarify what that is? MHCUs are mental health care users. Ah, right. Thank you very much. Just for those that weren't sure. And talking of the mental health care users, this is, you know, many of you have been to the meetings that we've had, uh, the workshops rather, I should call them, where we run whole workshops about writing and reporting responsibly on mental health. More than responsibly, just we need, well, we do need you to write responsibly, but we need people to still write about mental health because, if you look at it, we're the poor cousins. Mental health are the poor cousins of the health department's budget. It still comes out with zilch. SADAC comes out with nothing, not a cent from the government. When I'm doing media training, I always tell um, the guys at SADAC and, and so on, we can't, we know we're going to be asked those questions, but we can't comment too loudly on the government. One has to be careful. But at the same time, it is shocking that the government really are doing not just for SADAC, but so little for mental health care users, MHCUs. So we really need the media to keep focusing on mental health, despite, I mean, what more do you need than what's happening right now with COVID, with SADAC? Are getting have gone from having 400 calls a day to 1600 calls a day and i'm sure that today yesterday all this week not just through COVID, but the situation especially in kwazulu natal they've had many many more calls and there are so many things that they still need help with so we need the word to get out there and do contact sadag if you need any information because you know they're always there for you they're absolutely fantastic i just want to read a message from tato gafani and i hope I'm getting the pronunciations of these names um, correct. I feel so terrible for families that will have to relive this. The sad part about this is the officials were warned they saw this coming and they still acted contrary to the warnings. Yes, that, that is really the big message behind uh, the whole story. So, Umanyani, do you think, what do you think? Do you think criminal charges will be at the end of this road? Or is that really uh, a difficult question? It's an impossible question, um, given that we haven't even, we're not at day one yet. We, we really do have to, this is an important process in itself. Um, this also is a fact finding process. Um, before a judge, those who are coming as witnesses will be uh, questioned under oath. Um, and so this is an important and serious process that we um, have, have faith in that will do all the necessary to get to the bottom of these questions around the identity of the deceased, the cause of the death. Um, and causation is a, is a, is a difficult um, and vexed issue in law. We all were mesmerized by the Oscar Pistorius uh, trial where you know, there was a lot of talk about causation um, and what, what really constitute constitutes causation between the action or the intervening actions and the eventual death. 
Um, so these are really um, these are really vexed questions that will be ventilated in the inquest. Um, and at the end, of course, what what you know Christine and others have said is that part of this uh, uh, seeking justice is about seeing real accountability. Um, you know, things like uh, disciplinary process, things like having these health professionals who made this, these decisions in their professional capacity uh, removed from the role of doctors or nurses. Um, and indeed criminal sanctions. Um, you know, in, in the country we have seen so much of corruption um, and decimation of the state. And there's a real hunger for that level of justice to see, um, you know, the bars coming across somebody's face. Um, so this is something that definitely people want to see. We are not in a position to say, you know, that there will be um, prosecutions at the end of it, but we know that the NPA has been working on this matter for years. We have cooperated with the NPA for years. We've given them documents. They have the entire record of the arbitration and more information. Um, and so we have to really go through the process and see at the end of it, uh, what is possible and then advocate for the necessary. And can I ask you, do you know if the inquest is gonna be open to the press and public like the arbitration was? It is. Um, it's a little bit different because it's happening online. Um, so the, the judiciary does have a YouTube channel that will be streamed live um, through all of the days of, of evidence. Um, we will also, as I said, stream it on Facebook and share it in various ways. Uh, but in addition to that, journalists ordinarily would be able to go into court and uh, obtain documents. They can still do so uh, by contacting the secretary of the judge, Judge Tefo, um, in the Pretoria High Court. So if there are specific documents that journalists want to obtain, they can do so through that mechanism. I have a question here. Um, is there precedence in law where government negligence has a causal link to criminal liability? Um, it is a very big issue in the country at the moment. It is. Um, and I think what we have seen some, uh, we have, I mean, corruption is an example where we've seen uh, people going to jail. Um, this situation is quite unprecedented. Um, we, what's also unprecedented, I think, is that the level of political accountability uh, was quite unique at the time where the MEC was actually, actually had to step down um, and, and other officials like Dr. Silibano had to step down as well um, because of the public pressure, not because there was a step aside policy at that time. Uh, but that is, the, that is the kind of thing that has to happen. Um, I, I can't think of any situation that really resembles this that has led to uh, criminal sanctions. So um, I just want to clarify, everyone will be sent, all the people here today will definitely be sent a link so they can get into the inquest. They will. I wanted to clarify they will. We will share it on our social media um, and so if you follow us and follow SADAG, you'll be able to, to get that link and, and follow. But again, the judiciary has its website, judiciary.gov.za, I believe, um, and they will have a live link on, on Monday, from Monday. Once the inquest is finished, do you know what the next steps uh, will be? Somebody has asked. So the next steps are for the NPA. Um, the NPA will take the findings of the judge out of the inquest and then make decisions on whether there the is a link between um, the conduct and the deaths and whether there was any criminal action or omission. So it's the criminal action or omission that can lead to a criminal charge. Uh, you know, obviously one of the, the charges would be culpable homicide. Um, that's one of the charges that is possible that the NPA will consider. Um, there are other things like fraud, for example, um, that that might be that might be a, a, a competent charge coming out of the inquest. Um, we also know that uh, the MEC for Health at the time made certain um, utterances to Parliament, um, and if it's found that those were false, there are criminal sanctions for that. So there are a range of uh, criminal charges 
that may be competent depending on what the findings are in this inquest. I have a question, Harriet, for you, um, asking from your interviews with the families, what was the surprising trend or feeling that many of the families are hoping for from this process? Um, I think it's not a simple answer, and it also is a simple answer. Um, people wanted someone to be held accountable for what happened was an over, overwhelming sense from everyone. Um, and, I, and I think one mustn't forget how cruelly people died and how, in fact, hard it was for them to get compassionate, humane, decent responses during a, a very painful time for any family person who, who, who loses someone. People wouldn't give answers. They lied. They dismissed them. Uh, one person said when she finally found her, her, her brother, uh, Magdalena, the person at the hospital said, aha, you're number 94. Um, and she said, what do you mean number 94? She didn't understand that. So for me, the tie into the inquest is huge. People want to know why it happened and, and how. Um, yeah, I think that was a powerful part. Um, another question, I'm not sure who it's from. Um, I think, Umunyana, this would be for you. What will happen to people like Steve Mabona, the spokesperson then? He knew about and intimidated us as journalists. Oh, that's from Suzanne Fenter. If you could answer that, perhaps. Hi, Suzanne. Um, thanks for all your work on this over, over the many years. Um, Suzanne, I don't think that that is something that will necessarily be featured in the inquest. Um, if there is a complaint of intimidation, there are, you know, criminal sanctions there, but there's, it's not necessary to bring those through the inquest, but rather directly through the police. If, you know, if there was an intimidation, uh, criminal intimidation, then that can be prosecuted quite apart from uh, these proceedings. Um, but yeah, I mean, thanks. I know you went through so much to, to really get these stories out and did a lot of investigations. Um, yeah, that was really important. Well, I don't see any more questions. Has anyone got any final questions? I haven't got anything in front of me. So all it leaves me to do is say thank you so much to our speakers and for all of you again for attending. Just keep talking about Life Essay de Many don't let these stories go. Keep pushing with them and keep pushing with mental health. When things get back to normal, hopefully we'll have more workshops and have more speakers. And we will keep talking about both life is to many and mental health. So have a good day, everyone. And thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.